Hey, I'm Jonathan, and I live in London, England. Hey, I'm Jeff, and I live in Perth, Australia. Together, we are Echo and Sidetrack. We produce music that sounds like this. And this. And even this. This podcast is about music, creativity, and everything in between the giant space that separates us. Welcome to A Band Apart with Echo and Sidetrack. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Sure Order Burger Co. Use the code word ECHO for 10% off your order in-store on Hay Street and in Fremantle. Welcome back to A Bound Apart with ECHO on Sidetrack. Jeff, my co-host and my brother, how are you going? Um, I'm well, better than yesterday. I felt a bit sick in the studio. I still don't know what was wrong with me. Um, I think maybe... Um, too many nootropics were eaten and not enough sleep was had or something like that. I'm not sure. Jeff and I are trialing, um, on its alpha brain at the moment. Um, and we've had it before. I think we've talked about having it recently on a podcast, but yesterday we had a big day in the studio. So I thought we'd try having four. Maybe need... four is too much. Oh, four. It's funny. It's like too too much is. It just felt like I drank a lot of coffee and my head got really tight, like in the front of my in my frontal lobe. You didn't and... drink a lot of coffee though. No. Yeah. Yeah. But I drink. I think. I think. No more than you do regularly. Yeah, I didn't drink any more coffee than I did regularly. Yeah. Yes. So, um, maybe what I ate made me feel a bit sick in the stomach. I think the pie, the chicken I used and the pie I made on Monday was going off that day. So you are a piece of work. <laughs> no, it was reduced. Well, buy me now, I'm cheap. You can, <laughs> fuck it. You can just for the listeners that buy me now, I'm cheap joke refers to Christmas gifts Jonathan used to give when he was younger where he would give us a CD from JB Hi-Fi. Or DVD. And um, it would still have the price on it and sometimes a sticker that says, buy me now, I'm cheap. And arguably, <laughs> I would choose those films because they were good movies. I never bought a shit movie because it was cheap. I bought a good movie and with the added bonus that it was cheap. Yeah, you've got an eye for a bargain. Definitely. Thus, we go back to the chicken. Yeah, I think um, because I ate my serving of pie yesterday and had a bit of stomach issues and then had some (laughs) diaro. I built a dianorama. I built a diorama. Um, uh, Yeah, well, I just had a a headache yesterday. It's like a tightness and a bit of a tenseness. And I put that down to having four alpha brains and maybe potentially not enough food as well. Um, but I felt better. I wasn't going to make it to the gym, but I did feel better after going for about a 5K walk with my girlfriend. And, um, and yeah. Shout-outs to Holly Ray. Bush, bush. We had a show on the weekend. Yeah. We did the Reunited show. We were reunited. We were reunited. And it was lots of fun. How do you feel about it? Really good, man. I, um... It was a lot of work leading up to it, mm. um, and I I think this week I still feel somewhat of a hangover from it, like the release of doing it. And it was it was a lot of work because this is the first time we did we've done a, like a co promote show where it's like fifty fifty with the promoter and like where we're working with them, we're building a lot of the um, like content where pushing things. We've got more on the line. More on the line. So, like, we're putting together all of our videos, all of the artwork, T-shirts, um, plus putting together the set and new music that we wanted to play. Yeah. There was a lot of to-dos and then to nail it, to, like, perform it, to literally, like, do the theatre of it and play the show was a really big relief. And then to have it be a really big success as well. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not just people through the door and like a money thing. It's a success because it was a great step for our career and also a great night. Like, you know, we've done the promotion thing before, put on shows, but this felt like the biggest one 
and it like it was the biggest one and it was the most us it was really really good yeah i i definitely felt more stress leading up to this event than i ever have before um and i think partly because we were responsible for doing um so much and you were very, you were very responsible for all sorts of stuff like every video that got edited was basically you um all the graphics for me you were doing um so like you know you were editing small ads that were going out through facebook marketing and all sorts of stuff so like there was a lot of stuff that we would have previously been outsourced to someone else. Yeah. And we took control of that. And you particularly, you, you did an amazing work, job you. to work, you know, getting feedback from me, getting feedback from Origin. And I think that the fact that it was for us, like we kind of, uh, there's a there's a, there's a division of responsibility when you are playing a show and you're playing a show in the in the way of like a promoter books you you get a fee and then you come and play the show there's like you know you don't have to do as much marketing because it's the job of the promoter and you you well you do Mo- have a push you, but you, you have don't push. have to create no and the and you don't ha- story you don't know and you don't necessarily have to kind of worry about the selling you be the artist and you're you're going to sell tickets because you're because you're the artist and then the promoter sells tickets to the show and just kind of it lets people know that the show is happening. But I think like because it was it felt it felt very personal and that is is added because it was the first show in, in Perth that we'd done together. Mm. It was my like homecoming show. I was the homecoming king, the homecoming queen and uh <laughs> It was there was just a bit of pressure, and I really wanted it to be good. And it really felt like if it wasn't good, it it would reflect directly on us, which hasn't really been a like. I guess it happened a bit with the adventures, adventures with Echo on Sidetrack, but it wasn't to the same scale. It was just like important that the night went well, and. And as soon as we started playing, as soon as the fucking, that, that intro video finished and we pressed play and like the first mix was good, I felt good. And then we finished playing and everything just kind of happened perfectly. And sitting, you know, we went and had a drink and some dinner afterwards and sitting there and being like, oh, yeah, we fucking did it. We, we Like we succeeded in it and, yeah. and all the kind of the worry and the work and the stress of it was was worth it. So that brings me to ask you a question. Do you think the worry is required to do the work? No. I think the worry is... The worry stems from control. And in this circumstance, control of how things were perceived. So the things that I really worried about were um, how songs, how everything was perceived. Like, I definitely think that when it comes to certain things, when it comes to certain art, it's important to me that people like it and find it funny or that they enjoy it. Now, that's not particularly a good trait to have, in my opinion. I don't think you should be making art directly for other people, Mm. but for this, for this project, it really felt like we were on show and I wanted it to be good. And I was worried that... I wanted the visuals to be good or I wanted the fucking video at the beginning for people to laugh or I wanted adverts to convert and I, and it's this like build up and this anticipation and then you put something out and you, you, it's like a show you want to finish and you want the applause. Hmm. 
And I think that highlighted, one, how much the applause are important to me. Mm. And two, that you don't need the applause to be content with something. And three, you don't know when you're going to get the applause and when you're not going to get the applause. For instance, I thought that quarantine video that we made was going to be the video of the campaign. I thought after we put out that first video with the, with me, you and Carl, um, it was a pretty quick little idea. We just have a joke about like everyone putting put, our hands put on, hand each on other. together and then we kind of coming up with the shoot, what to shoot on the fly. And then that does, you know, that's really positive for the campaign. It help, probably helps to sell quite a bit of tickets. It's funny. We put it on our TikTok and it gets like over a hundred K views. It's, it's successful. And then I'm like in the Follow back on TikTok. And then and then in the back of my head I'm like oh, fucking wait until they see that quarantine video. Okay. And then that doesn't get as much reach or it doesn't come out with the same fever that the other one does. And I'm like fuck. That was like I thought this was going to be the one. And you know, you can be wrong about stuff and that's fine, but that's an interesting thing about expectations. Though. Yeah, it highlighted that my expectations for some things are higher than others. And I think I'm kind of getting to know, I'm working out which actually matter and which actually don't matter. Because, you know. A lot of it doesn't. A lot of it doesn't. And a lot of it, a, a lot of the small minutiae things that I kind of focus on, I think editing some of the visuals, I was like, the edit's a bit weird. I don't really like this this kind of cut. But it's a fucking visual that's playing behind someone playing a DJ set that's going to need someone watching the TV. No one is going to be watching the screen behind us. I got go, loads of great comments on the visuals. People loved it. People loved seeing our faces up there. They yeah. were laughing at them. And no, like and enjoying them. They were they were an addition to the show. They were not a distraction yeah. by any means. And they were great. And no one's, but no one's being like, oh, that was a bit of an interesting cut. It's like you, you notice the small, the small things that no one else does and you can fixate on those small issues. I, I remember listening to a podcast with, um, I think it was Robert Rodriguez and he talks about editing and he's like, he talks about Sin City or you know one of his commercially successful films and he's like, there's a couple of bits in that that I still cringe when I watch yep. because I'm like, we just didn't get it right. And no matter how many people are telling him like, you fucking nailed that movie or you smashed it there's still that little those little things that you fixate on whether it's before or after you kind of present the art and I think leading up to it I felt fixated on a couple of those things that I wanted to get right and then you know after on reflection and we're going to do a bigger reflection um but afterwards I'm like Fucking that that thing didn't really matter. Mm. The thing that I was worried about didn't matter. And didn't happen? And no, and and didn't happen and, and didn't Yeah, and didn't cause me it caused stressing about stuff. I mean this is hindsight, but like stressing about stuff caused me more anguish than not stressing. But again, it's like un- somewhat uncharted territory that now I know how to better deal with it in the future. Like I remember Daniel saying something about we weren't happy with something. And Daniel was like, well, you know, we'll do better tomorrow. And maybe it was about how a piece of content had had performed or that hadn't been many conversions or or something that something promotory that we don't really understand and that you can't control and that we can't control and we're like is there some way to do something in this scenario and Daniel's like oh we'll just like deal with it tomorrow you know this happens and it's this very like he's obviously done fucking hundreds of shows and he's like yeah this is this is what it's like like this is regular and I, I think a large part of that worry does come from the fact that I'm 
not a promoter in any stretch of the imagination. I don't really want to be a promoter. I like certain aspects of the process, but I'm not. Yeah, I used to used to dealing with this kind of. So with this, yeah, lesson that you've learned that the worry isn't required to do the work. Do you think with more projects, you know, shows, music, movies, anything, you might try and take that on board and be like, I can be just a little, a few notches calmer because I know what we're creating is good. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think some of it is believing your own worth and also your own ability, like, and that I'm saying your own as in my own and your own, like, echo and sidetracks own thing. Like, I didn't have the same potential concerns. I mean, I have done a few more shows in the last year than you have and some in more of that capacity where, like, we have had a bit more of a control over it or things like that. Um, And... So I've probably got more experience in that department. But also there was this like thing that I was like, I know this is going to be good and it's going to be really good if we can do X, Y, Z. So rather than, and I'm not sure that this is exactly how you're thinking, but rather than thinking this will be good if we do X, Y, Z. It's like, there's, do you see the like the yeah. differences? It's, like, it's, if I do this, it will be good, rather than it will be good, and it will be better if we do, when these, I things. do these things. I, I, I also recognise that I feel and have felt since coming home fairly fucking high strung because I don't believe. This is partly why I'm going to go see a psychologist. I don't believe I'm processing things about... I think me coming home needs to be processed better than my usual kind of like relaxed bit blasé, like, yeah, it'll be okay, like, I'm going to do this and do that and I'll get back there and no, no, no. I think it needs to have, be a bit more unpacked and I feel that kind of not happening. And I feel more now that the show's done, which is kind of what we were preparing for, there's a bit more room to to unpack that professionally. Um, but I definitely felt, this, there were a lot of emotions leading up to the show, and I definitely think that the, the added stress came from that. Like you know, again, there's that the voice that's inside the head that's like, the show better be fucking good. You've moved countries for it. You've come back home for it. It better be good. Be sure, like this is the reason why you came home. This is the reason why you turned your, like, changed your life again. Like, Mm -hmm. there's there's lots of those kind of feelings going through my head before leading up to this kind of thing. Yeah. That's, that that again, it's just like a little bit of, it's a little bit in the cup. So that causes, as you start filling the cup with more stuff, even if they're simple things like, Planning a set or, you know, finishing off a song. They cause the cup to overflow quicker than they usually would. Yeah, for sure. Carl's about to interrupt this podcast. He's about to interrupt the podcast. Let's just let him. Carl? We're recording the podcast. Yeah. Can we come and say something? Well, did somebody clean the coffee machine after they used it? Not that I know. That's not how we do things here. I th- maybe I did. <laughs> Leave that thing gritty. <laughs> Leave him get a mouldy boy. <laughs> it looks clean, doesn't it? Which, which one? The filter one? The filter. Maybe Chris did. Somebody cleaned it. Sorry, I'm just I might have forgotten because it's <laughs> 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 
What are you talking about? Uh, we're just actually talking about the show, and I was just expressing to Jono about a little bit about the. He was telling me that he like there was a bit of worry and stress leading up to it, as there always is. And I said, "Do you think now you can, now that you've hit that worry threshold, you'd be like, I don't have to worry about something so much." Yeah, you know, it's like, oh, did I? I was like, was the worry? Do you need worry to work, or can you now be like, no, I can like be a bit more. It's not even confidence, like just be a bit like, I don't have to stress about this thing. You've, you've got a bit more space to now understand. You've got a bit more, it's it's space. It's having a bit more space. Like that thing is done. The thing I was worrying about is done. We succeeded. Now for the next step, I, I can one learn how to deal with it better. And also, you know, deal with the other shit that was that baseline war that was causing me stress and anxiety in the first place. I, I Yeah, I, do, I don't believe that you have to worry to get the work done. And it's actually better if you don't. And yeah. as you get like some better processes as well, you will worry less. Yeah. Stress comes from the... In my experience... Hi, this is Carl. Shock on. <laughs> uh, long-time listener, first-time guest. <laughs> <laughs> In my experience, the stress comes from, well, there's always going to be unknowns that pop up, you know, and it's putting on your own shows is essentially like just learning another system. Yeah. And when, when you get to know that system, less unknowns pop their heads up. Unknowns being, you know, costs and invoices that you didn't realize you'd be, you know, liable to pay for yeah. and things like that. But like, and as, as you go on, you, you, it's the same thing, like this. And there's multiple people involved, and as you go through it, their roles become clear. And the more people know their roles, the more things can run smoothly. And you can really the the biggest stress comes from like, will people buy tickets? Yeah, will we sell enough tickets to make this a worthwhile endeavor? Which, yeah. which is the, you know, which is the hardest thing. It's the biggest unknown in our industry, isn't it? I, I, know, I you know, as we were selling tickets. If you, if you have a studio day where you're working on a new tune and say it just doesn't sound right at the end of the day and then you look at ticket sales for the end of that day and it's like, you sold 10 t- tickets today. My mind goes, we fucking sold 10 tickets and they somehow know that this song is shit and like <laughs> fucking, what the fuck? Like what the fuck is going on? I mean, and it's like it's like directly correlated even though it's completely not. The la- like. The last thing I want to see in the lead up to any show, regardless of if I'm like promoting myself or not, is ticket sales. Yeah, it's um, such a stressful number. You're like, why isn't it growing? And the most uninspiring thing, you, you know, because yeah, you can't you can't help but like uh, link, you know, value to the value in, in, to when really personal value. To, there's yeah. so many other things. It's like people didn't get paid. There's ten other shows. That person's got a, a birthday. Ho- Holly yeah. pointed out something really amazing that I hadn't thought of. Like two days before the show, she was like, it's not just you're, – you're not just competing with other events that are on. You're also competing with other people that have moved their social engagements, like people's 21st, people's 18th, Hi. so-and-so's life that got shifted because of that lockdown a few weeks ago. Some people moved it to this time and they're like, that's my obligation – that's my above going to a show. It's not just like regular programming where people are like, my highest obligation is to go to this party on the weekend. Now it's like, no, life is my actual obligation. Party is secondary. Mm. So, yeah. It's- and, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll leave you with this. You know, like we've, we've talked about this before, but, you know, I've had shows where I've sold 100 pre-sale tickets for a thousand person venue. On the night, you're just and like you know, like this is gonna suck. This you're just thinking, and you're like, what have I done wrong? I don't understand. Am I thought I'm not relevant anymore? Am I am I done? Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. (laughs) What? And then 900 people rock up and buy pre-sales. Yeah, but not pre-sales, but buy door door sales. Yeah, and you're just like, you know, I'm awesome. But but what it does tell you, I'm all that is there. It's like plenty of people still like what you do and want to come and see you. But there's no sense of urgency among them. Yeah, none of them think that your show is going to sell out. Yeah. So that's the that's the takeaway I took from that. Like, okay, I have to somehow increase the sense of urgency among my audience. Um, and yeah. and when you start thinking about those things, like 
trying to modulate ticket sales beyond demand mm. or attention is an art. And then that's when you, that's, it's you real promotion. What? Attention. Attention. Yeah. We're, but, we're, in the, we're in the attention game now. Absolutely. And it's also interesting, like what sells out a show? Someone's be, someone going, I think if I wait any longer, the, I'm not going to get a ticket. And I really, really want to see this guy, this girl, that act, anything. Yeah. And I don't want to miss out. FOMO. Yeah. And yeah, it's a it, powerful thing. Yeah. It's, and Which is unfortunate because like you don't want people to miss, you don't want people to miss out on this show. No. But if they don't sometimes, then they, then the audience, then there is no sense of urgency. You know yeah. what I mean? And when you are, you know, it's, it's very nice to come at these like, things from a very, I guess, altruistic, idealistic, it's music, everything. But when it's like your livelihood, you have to be a bit more pragmatic and strategic about it. Yeah. Um, because I like, want, there is a num there is a number that is like a break even, but then there's a number you're like, okay, we're going to make money from this. And that's what we're in it for. Because it's so funny to think people go like, well, DJs get paid like, you know, 50 grand for an hour's work. It's like, no, because they've just, they've been doing it for 15 years and they didn't get paid for the first 10. And, but like, and not, a, it's not just that, like what, you know, people see that hour, hour and a half, two hours on stage. Yeah. What they don't see is the three of us in this warehouse every day of the week. Yeah. Crying, banging our heads on the walls. Yeah. Like struggling. Not getting paid not by getting the hour. Not getting paid a cent. <laughs> At all. <laughs> Not getting paid a cent. And like, and like we put that upon ourselves. I get that. Yeah. But like that in my mind is where it, it balances out. That's where you earn your money. And if you want, if music's going to be free now, which it is, yeah. then sorry, people, the, the premium is going to come in your ticket sales. Mm. Because again, it's like we make music for free. Nobody pays for the music we, we make. Um, it's essentially an advert for the shows we put on, oh. you know? And like, that's the way it is. I don't think the th any, either of us, any, no one in this room is like got enough power to really enact any change on that model. No. All we can do is try to adapt to it. And to me, that is like, all right, well, if, 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 if my music isn't worth you spending a dollar on, then that's got to go on to the ticket sales. That, yeah, that's, you know. Yeah. That's 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 where the value is now. I just I just no, I just thought of someone being like, mm, "That song's a dollar. I don't think I'm going to pay for it." Which they do do. Yeah, but this is the thing. Like, they don't consciously do that, but the model that's provided to them encourages that behaviour. Humans, by nature, won't pay for none, and we 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 are, we are not exempt from this. Humans no. won't pay for something that they don't have to pay for. Absolutely. Um, Imagine hitting a threshold of Spotify plays. Oh, Spotify plays during a day, you're a listener, and then it's like, please insert coin, essentially. Yeah. And people would be like, what? fuck that, I'm going to go to the free service. Oh, I've got a different login to get my hit my um, quota for the day. Yeah. Like, you'd work out so many workarounds. Yeah. It's, a, it's like it's the Netflix sharing of people's passwords. Mm -hmm. Like, it's $10, and you're like, for heaps of shows? For can, all the shows. Yeah, for all the shows. Can I, do you reckon I could, and like, but it used to be like, Ten dollars is one third of a C a compact disc. Yeah, like yeah. you'd go to the CD store. And movies, or are, and movies are a lot more expensive to make the music too. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? exactly. Yeah. Oh. We say we're, so we're, 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 sorry, I've, I've totally derailed the argument the, into the value of art. Well, which is <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's it's interesting though. Like, and and maybe that's why there is this stress because. This is where so much of the value now lies yeah. that you're like, I hope this is good. I hope people come. I believe, even if you believe in yourself that you're going to put on a great show, that it's going to be fantastic, you're like, am I communicating that fantasticness enough to the people to want them to buy a ticket? And when you see that ticket number mm -hmm. creep up by five and someone goes, that's pretty good for a Sunday, you're like, we should have sold 50 because I'm great. But And then, like, I guess the other side of that coin is... Isn't it mental that however many hundreds of people came to your show the other weekend, isn't it mental that that many people that, you know, 
you guys are important enough for them to come and share that with you and to pay for it. Like, yeah. that is actually amazing. That's incredible. That, that you hold that much yeah. kind of space in someone's psyche. Yeah, um, totally. That Like, that is really humbling to me. Yeah, it's so and it's so cool. And it's I, that's, the, I suppose, the thing we haven't spoken about, John, is that, like, the the act and the performance and everything was really great. But then it's so, so cool to like look out and all those people and like, you came to see us. We're just Jeff and Jono. Mm. Like we put all, we do all this work. We put on music, we put out songs and then someone comes up to you at the end and go, I'm so fucking glad you played that song. Cause that's my favorite song or this. And you're like, ah, this is the real reason we do it. It's not because you paid 40 bucks for a ticket. Yeah. It's because music is bigger than all of us. Yeah. Anyone want a coffee? Please. Um, okay, I'll put it. Bye. This is Chuck One signing out. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. Um, please hit the subscribe button. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Carl. It's, 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 so, it's so cool. It's like one of the, the coolest things. Yeah. And it's something it that's is. hard to think about in the moment that you're like, I'm so appreciative of all of the fact that I'm part of your rotation, listener. Yeah, I think I think sometimes we fixate again, you fixate on the smaller stuff and if you're that way inclined, you'll fixate on the on the negative sometimes. I remember how often early in our career we would say after after a set we'd be like I fucking miss that mix. Or like that fucking bit where you fucked up or I fucked up and you'd kind of tell we the other person. We didn't even play that song. Yeah. And then we we recognized it because I think someone came up to us after would come up to us after a set and be like, You guys smashed it and the first thing we'd say is like, Nah, but like I missed this double drop. Like blah blah blah. Like we'd fix that on the small thing and we picked it picked each other up on it and we're like, from now on we do not say that. We say thank you. And like we we recognize that someone's giving us a compliment. And And you say and you take the compliment. And you take the compliment. And I think we're much better at obviously much better at doing it now, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's good that we started talking about the, the super positives because it is extremely humbling and like lovely to see someone come up and be like, someone said to me, they said, cause I went down and spoke to quite a few people. And a a guy came up to me and said, I love everything you guys do. I love the podcast. I listen to it. I think it's fucking hilarious. I love your music. I love the videos you do. And I love the fact you guys are brothers. Like, I just, I I think, I think you guys, I think you guys are so successful because you're like fucking normal guys. You're funny and you're just genuinely nice guys. And I think there's a lot of people supporting you because of that reason. Like what fucking a lovely compliment to get. Like mm, thank I, you. Like I think there's there's probably someone we we have a fan out there that would buy a song, maybe not because they like the song, but because they like the podcast. Or like they they would they would do something because they like us and they might not exactly like the 100% the product you know there's artists out there that are like 100% the product we are yeah. very much artists that are it's, it's us it's, it's every, us everything it's, we are is, is in yeah, our is, music exactly. in our videos everything like and so people there's are no in, sham people, here people are investing essentially in Jeff and Jono they're not just investing in you know name another product Samsung something like that they're investing in us as people which and because we're so i mean not to i mean this whole podcast is kind of inside baseball but uh yeah like we're intrinsically tied to our thing we are not we are not a samsung where the product is the thing we are the product we're here for like a better expression we're the product and some people do it really well to create a product and become that persona and act like that and then they can have a personal life. We are we allow people into, into our, our personal, personal life because and that comes through in our brand. Yeah. 
and that's that's us. That's that's us. And that's maybe why you know I met a guy who was at the bar with his girlfriend when I was buying uh, drinks for mum and dad. Um, and he was like, I'm a big fan of the podcast and I've sent you some music in the past. I'm not sure if you've seen it. And I was like, fuck man, I'm really sorry. Like, like I sometimes bad at missing messages. Like, please resend it. Like, of course. And, um, I wish I could have had a longer chat with him, but you know, running around trying to fucking sell t-shirts and make sure people are on the door and things like that. But I was like, whoa, this person like consumes a lot of our stuff and like likes us and I'm really glad that I can meet him and like be like oh yeah this is I'm me I, there's not some great disparity it's not like I meet him and he's like oh I'm a big fan of the podcast and I'm like speak with a different voice and I'm like oh th- that stuff yeah I just you know I just read a few books and spout off some shit I don't believe half the stuff I say yeah whatever thanks for checking it out and like walk off it's authenticity yeah but it's it's authenticity without choosing authenticity as, as a brand. It's like, yeah, you know, making a fucking something out of um, wood and being like, it's so rustic and authentic and then selling it to people as rustic and authentic but then you make that in a factory but you sell it as handmade. That's almost fake authenticity. Genuine, the true meaning of authenticity is like, but that's just how it is. It's like, your true colors shining through. That's like, why do you make that thing out of wood or something? Like, oh, because that's what I do. And there's, I think, true. Fuck, this sounds like such an arrogant and like blow your own horn kind of comment. But like, true authenticity comes through. And to use not use us as an example. Look at like another, an artist. Um, you know, think of any of your other favorite musicians or even filmmakers. And you can see when there's like too many chefs in the kitchen trying to make something that has a certain appeal, like, you know, forcing it too much, the expectations too much in this one department. And then someone just comes along and goes, this is the kind of music or this is the kind of art I want to create. And everyone's like, wow, that one is amazing. It's like, oh, I just did it because. Yeah. Like, it's just, it came out of me. It was like a natural flow. And sometimes you've got to force art out. And sometimes it just comes out. And I think finding that the balance and also knowing how to get it out is an important thing. And also get it out without the stress and the and the struggle. Because one thing I said to you several times during it, I'm like, we're going to perform. It's going to happen. Saturday is going to happen. Mm. I believe with preparation, it, it will be really good yelling at each other now doesn't stop that thing happening and doesn't it technically only delays it and derails what we're currently working on so let's not let the stress get to us where we yell at each other blame each other get frustrated at anything we're doing cuz the thing we're doing is still going to happen so it's like we need to work out the best way to work through this rather than get derailed 10 times and then after all that frustration and stuff still be like it's still happening it's like putting something off before you before a deadline doesn't move the deadline yeah for sure and i and i do i do think that stress in both of us highlights issues in our relationship and it's more reflective of of our relationship rather than necessarily the um, execution of a goal. I think it's more like stress just stress brings to the surface issues that we've, we have in our life together rather than, and, and stress is caused by doing a project that's really important to us both. Yeah. And I'm, what I'm trying to say is, and it's probably trying to try and stress a little less because Things are going well, and we're doing it. And yeah. when both of us are not stressed, we, we both have better. we more bandwidth to work. Absolutely, better. and I do think, yeah, I think the the stress is a combination of quite a few things. That, like I said before, I'm now that we have succeeded, and I have more air in my head or more space to 
to deal with those things. I can, I can, yeah, go, go conquer. Try saying that in like a more upbeat way. Uh, now that, <laughs> now that we, we have, like, now that, I'm sorry, now that we succeeded, I can now go and also <laughs> succeed in some things that are moving around my head. Yeah. That's, that's a lovely way to put it. Like, so I was just off in thought. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's good to challenge yourself and you – I think we succeeded. I think we took on a challenge and we succeeded. I think we did more than succeed, Jonathan. I think we had – Shined? Yeah. What's more it. than succeed? Succeed seems like completion. Um, success is like – See, completion to me is finishing the race. Success is coming first. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good way of putting it. I think we succeeded and we did it with class and we did it. Succeeded expectations? We exceeded expectations. Ex- exceed. That's, that's I exceed expectations. I had a number of people that I wanted to have in the venue when we played and we exceeded that number. So yep. that's really great. And And the performance exceeded my expectations and my expectations are – unnaturally high so jonathan congratulations also might add that our parents came and watched us for the first time and it exceeded their expectations yeah i'm really glad that they they came to that one and so cool that was i mean that was also a, a like a stress i don't think we really 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 talked about it at all but that was a stress a little worry that I had. I wanted it to be good. Again, like, you know it's going to be good. I knew it was going to be good. I knew it was going to be fine. Keep but reminding yourself that things are going to be good. But there's still this, like, it's a worry. It's just a, it's a worry that, like, what if something... Explodes. Ex- no, we're just like, what if it's... I don't know. It just felt like there was a lot on the line. And one of the things that was on the line for me, I, like, I wanted mum and dad... I wanted it to be impressive and I wanted, I wanted, we've gotten their approval before, obviously, and especially more so over the past year, two years, three years as, as we've become more successful. But there's still that part of me that wants, you know, especially dad to be like, you guys are doing good. It really, it really meant something when he was like, I see I see it. I now I now I understand a bit more of what you guys are doing and I see it and I like it. You guys are successful. You're doing it. That means a lot to me at least cuz it's like approval. Appro- it's approval from definitely means a lot to me and I think you're you know someone that you want approval from. Yeah, I think it's um and you don't have to explain it. We didn't have to come home and be hung over and then, like, mom and dad be like, hey, how was the show? They were like, that was fucking sick. I liked the bit where you guys were performing together or when fucking... The video it, was really funny. and Yeah, like, people got on each other's shoulders and, like... Yeah. And the people that went up to them, that was the other thing. They were like, so many people came up and talked about how much they liked you guys. Wow. And I liked what you guys do. It's so cool. Yeah, I think that's... I think for me, it was like a closing of a loop. Um, context wise because think of um, them only ever seeing images of us playing yeah, and then and hearing our music and then to combine the two in performance I mean obviously they watch videos and stuff but to be there and then to kind of be like oh this is what our boys work towards when they go to the studio and this is you know in some respects this is what the you know the last ten years of their lives have been about when they're like hung over and they you know don't want to do their chores on a Saturday or you know not that obvious but like you know this is what it was all leading to like oh okay you know this is yeah. this is this is great it's like it's like you close that that loop of being like this is what this is what my boys do and this is what Echo on Sidetrack is. Yeah. And like, wow, they've got 
they've got fans. They've got like people came to see them. They've got like oh, the, I th- I recognize that song. Yeah. Like Dad said, he's like, oh, Paper Bird seems to be a popular song. I, I quite like that song. And you know, Mum was like, oh, that's a real, it's such a lovely song. And like, would you ever play the acoustic one? I'm like, oh, probably not in that context. And Dad even said. I understand the drums and drum and bass more yeah. now because you, you have to like blend everything together. And I'm like, yeah, that's why everything sounds like quote unquote the same. Because when the studio was at home, he would often be like, have you ever thought about changing up the drum, the, the drum beat, you know, make it a bit slower. And obviously drum bass is a certain BPM, so you can't necessarily do that easily. And then, yeah, to hear him be like, I get it. I get drum and bass now. I get the energy behind it and I get why people dance and I yeah. I get the the... the the what's what's the word I'm looking for? The primal, the primal movement behind it. Yeah, you understand. They un- both mum and dad understand a little bit more about what we do, and they now they've got context. And they'll do you know what they also have, Jono? They will have an experience that they'll remember. So when we show them photos from a festival or show them video from here, they're like, oh, that's what Context. it sounds like at that thing. Oh, there was like, were there lots of like, what, that confetti and things like yeah. that? I was like, oh, no, this one, we did this. And they're like, oh, cool. Did you play that new song? And when we play them a piece of music, they will better be able to understand that that music exists predominantly in a nightclub. That's where it's meant to be heard, loud and with lots of people around you, not, you know, played through my UE Boom speaker in the kitchen when the song's finished. And mum and dad go, oh, that's a cool song. It's like they're like they understand better how the music transplants to the, transplants to the space. Yeah, it's meant to be performed in, and I think that's really really cool. And then it was even cool when we, they were speaking on Skype to our older brother, and we told them that they came to the show. Ben was like, "Yeah, Echo and Sidetrack shows are great," and I was like, "Yeah, Ben's seen us play a few times, and I yeah. can't wait till he can see us again." Yeah, and the next the next thing will be. Ben's kids coming to one of the shows. Yeah, abs- absolutely. And and then like, or even to to play in America and be like, we're coming to you and we're playing. That would be sick. Yeah, it will happen, buddy. We did well. We won. We exceeded expectations. We did, and we fucking won. And I think this is only a sign of things to come. We're doing really, really well. And dear listener, if you're doing something. And it seems like it sucks at the moment and it's hard. Keep doing it because it gets better. Because to sit here now and look at all of the things we've succeeded and the things we are doing music wise, I think back sometimes to those moments where I was like, fuck this fucking thing. Why did I just spend two and a half thousand dollars on speakers? Mm. My music sucks. Why did I, why am I even here? Like, oh, this is the worst. Like, I want to quit. I want to quit. I want to quit. Like, I've thought probably not in the last two years, two and a half years. I haven't had a, but maybe just there, there were moments before that that were like, okay, I feasibly have to work out what I'm going to do with this life. But now, I mean, not now. But it all becomes clearer as you work harder and you get more success. Mm. And the but of course becomes louder. Oh, of course we're going to do that. Of course we're going to work on this remix. Of course this is going to be a success. Like we just have to keep doing what we're doing because we are, for lack of a better expression, experts in our field. We know how to rock a party. We know how to make a good song. Let's put those things into processes into action and and do them and that sounds kind of cold and uncreative but we do know so like we're doing well congratulations man congratulations to you too thanks we are doing well let's continue yeah and listener keep doing what you're doing yeah because you're also succeeding in that thing and you will exceed your own expectations eventually yeah maybe you'll do it tomorrow Especially if you learn to like temper some of those expectations so that that gap becomes smaller because you know that once you've reached the first lot of expectations, you can do set a new target. If you've got, you know, if 12 years ago I've said my goal is to do this and 
like, you know, play the show we just played on the weekend, that would have felt so far away and there would have been way too many places to fall off along the way. But if the first goal was like, I just want to play a show, like I remember getting paid the first time we got paid. Like someone was like, yeah, send, um, send us an invoice or they gave us an envelope on the night and like we drove away from that show being like, fucking rich. Like, what do you want to spend 80 bucks on, bro? Like, I don't know, we could get some food now. Like, oh, we could get breakfast in the morning. Like, what the fuck? And so, and so, not that it's always about money, but like, that was a very clear metric of what success was, was yeah. at the time. And it's always having those little steps along the way. And now our goals are far further beyond where we're at. But you're like, oh, this is, I'm in the, I can do this thing. It's like riding a bike. Like, yeah, I can keep my balance. You never forget how to ride a bike. It's like you try, you fall, you try, try, try. And then all of a sudden you're just like, you've got that momentum and momentum is key. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to end the podcast, buddy. Thank you very much for the conversation. Thank you. Thanks for special guest, Carl Thomas, aka Shock One. We should get him on a an actual podcast. We should. He hasn't been on since the old podcast. Yeah. It's a good. Actually, we are going to have a um, uh, look at getting a couple of guests coming up. So stay tuned. Thank you for listening and um, subscribe, share with your friends, tell your mum, and uh, tell your friends you love them. See you, everyone. See you, buddy. I love you. I love you too. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Uh, make sure you subscribe to us on your podcast app and keep up to date with all new episodes. They're going to be coming out once a week. We are Echo and Sidetrack on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, on Twitter, we are Echo Sidetrack. Go listen to our music on Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, YouTube, or wherever your ears consume happiness. Lots of love, people. <laughs> <laughs>